Inshallah, um, what we want to talk about today is the idea of uh, is, is the practice of thinking. And the most important uh, starting point for us is uh, building our foundations and framework, which is going back to the most fundamental hadith of our tradition that explicates what Islam is to begin with. We all know this hadith. The Prophet Muhammad was approached while he was with his companions by someone that no one has ever seen before. His clothes weren't dirty, yet he was a traveler, clearly. No signs of travel on him, very strange. And he sits right where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was sitting, puts his hands on the thighs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sits knee to knee, and he starts asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very pointed questions, to the point where the companions became very concerned. One of them wanted to, you know, <laughs> you know who that was, right? Almost was just like, all right, did he take care of this man? Or like, what? I got my sword with me. And he starts asking him these pointed questions. The first was what? Who knows his hidden? What was the first question that was asked? Yeah? What is Islam? Yeah, akhbirni Islam. Tell me about Islam. Now, Islam is both the word that describes our religion, and it's also a dimension of our religion, not the whole thing, right? And this dimension in particular, is the dimension of the outward practice of Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gives him the five pillars, all of which are actions, right? Why is the Shahada as, as one of the five pillars? Isn't the testimony of faith, should it be under faith? That's something for you to think about, we'll come back to it. The second question was, Tell me about faith, tell me about belief, Iman. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gives him the six articles of faith that we all know and memorize in previous days, if you grow up um, Are there more than six articles for our faith? Does anyone know? This is not a trick question. I know I always sound like I'm asking trick questions. I don't mean to do that, sorry. Maybe it's like my face or the way I ask it. But is there more than six articles of faith? Yes. Way more. Way more. So many more. But the problem solved something is the foundation. Then, he gives him the six articles to believe in God, to believe you know, in the angels, the last day, etc. You all know the six articles. And then, the Prophet Sallallahu is asked, أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَانِ Tell me about Ihsan. Okay? Which literally in Arabic doesn't translate to excellence, it actually translates to beauty. That's the proper translation. The best encompassing translation is beauty through uh, uh, excellence through beauty. Or beauty through excellence for your It's beauty through excellence. That's the connotation of excellence. So then the Prophet says, no. he tells him what? He says, it is to worship Allah and ta'bud Allah ta'ala. To worship Allah, to submit to God, to devote yourself to God as though you see Him present at all times. And when you are able to witness that reality, you at least recognize that he's there watching. Right? That when you don't see him in crystal clear form, know that he sees you. Can God be physically seen? Good. That's a, that should be a very quick, visceral reaction response to you. Right? This idea that God has hands and body parts, and this is the one of the biggest bid'ahs that ever existed in, in Islam. This doesn't exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they said that make the shape of Islam. He is beyond space and time, beyond physicality, beyond any form of contingent realities that we experience as creation and human beings. That's what makes him God. That's what makes the aqidah of Islam unique. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is saying, it, Worship as you see God. So we know we can't see physically God. So what is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about? This is what we're going to start by talking about. When, but just to conclude the story, if you haven't heard it before, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also asked to tell me about the signs of the hour. And he gives him some signs of the hour. And then when the man leaves, they're all confused. Who was this man? The companions ask. And so he sees Omar especially concerned and confused. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says to Allah radiallahu anhu, do you know who that was? And because the companions 
were first taught adab more than anything. They knew immediately when something like that is asked, the response is, God and His Messenger know best. Right? An uh, 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 unspoken of etiquette the companions had. So then the, the Prophet says, that was Jibreel, who came to teach you your religion. Almost every scholar in our history said that this is the foundational hadith of our entire faith. Hadith Jibreel, we call it Hadith Jibreel. There's many other names for this hadith. Question, Ihsan, we saw how the Prophet defined this dimension of our faith. It's a dimension, by the way. A lot of the times when people say, what is Ihsan? They'll say, to purify your heart, things like that. Okay, but where in the actual statement is purification of the heart? Prophet where does he say to purify our hearts from illnesses? And not directly, no. How does the Prophet pointedly respond with an answer? What is the point of response of the Prophet and the answer? To worship God is that you see Him. We know we can't physically see God. And we know part of the dimension of Islam, the five pillars, is what? Prayer. So we also know the Prophet is not talking about acts of worship that we're already familiar with. So what is Ihsan? What is this dimension that's translated as beauty? Where does beauty come from? Well, the simple response is that this is the dimension of religious experience and ethics. So of course, if our hearts are filled with a bunch of garbage, if our minds are corrupt, right? Just like what we mentioned in the khutbah, the Prophet said really interestingly, when the Bedouin questioned him about kissing his children, the Prophet didn't say, this is a good thing, you should try it. He said, my religion has nothing to offer someone who doesn't have mercy in their heart. In other words, that when you lack compassion, there are dimensions of the faith you won't have access to. You won't get it. You won't be able to experience. You won't be able to understand. Right? Similarly, similarly, purification of the heart, the, the, the removal of vice from within us internally, the acquisition of virtue, these things are necessary to the process of seeing, worshiping God as though you see Him, right? Because the Prophet is how he's not trying to be redundant. He didn't say, Ihsan is the way that you do Salah, which is one of the five pillars. No, he said it's a dimension. Akhbini an Ihsan, a separate dimension, right? So that has to be a unique dimension by definition. So Prophet said that. He was teaching us that this is the realm of religious experience. That while faith, belief, iman, which is really the mind, which is a mention of the mind. And the reason why is because faith enters the heart through many things, but is not substantiated through experience. It can't be. Because everyone can just wake up and say, you know, I had a dream. Jesus came to me in a dream, and he said, I am God. Okay, you know, maybe your dream, I'm Amy Ross. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm glad you're having these vivid dreams. It sounds really cool. It's fun. I wish I had these dreams. But that's not, that's not proof. That's not proof for religious belief, right? The only proof for religious belief has to be a mediating, a mediating tool that we all recognize. Not even the Quran can be proof for God's existence alone. Why? Someone says, well, God must exist. Why? He, uh, he said so in the Quran. How do you know the Quran is written? <laughs> because God said it's, it's true. It, you end up in this circular argument. What mediates belief is reason. In addition to this, and I know this is a long-winded introduction, but it's important. So you know this, this, is, this is from the core of our game. Right? In addition to this, Islam, Islam, you might have the correct doctrine, belief system. You might have all the forms of ritual practice down. You know what the Prophet warns us of towards the end of times? He says you will see people that become popular start to prop up. How does he describe them? Does he say, you know, they're like, uh, uh, 
they they're dressed in suits and they talk really nice and how does the Prophet also describe it? He says that when you see them pray, you will feel ashamed next to them. Meaning, you will look at their prayer and then look at your prayer and say, I really suffer, subhanAllah. Uh, like, wow, their prayer is incredible. Right? You will literally consider your own prayer nothing compared to what they do. But then what is Ramadan saying? say? He said that they will recite the Quran if it does not go past the point. In other words, their heart is corrupt, but the actions are great. They'll, they, they'll, they'll know where to put their hands in salah. They'll know how to stand in salah. They might even come for prayer early. They'll do all of this. You know who else did all of this? The hypocrites. MashaAllah. The hypocrites did all of those things. The hypocrites, by the way, used to make salah in the masjid regularly. But they were called hypocrites because they were lazy going. <laughs> SubhanAllah, what is our state? You know, may Allah protect us from nifaq. But they were lazily coming towards prayer. So you can, what are we learning here? Why is it sound its own dimension? Because you can have the right ritual actions, the outward practice, you can get it down packed. You fast, you do all this stuff. You have the right belief system, and you'll still be the lowest people in hellfire because of a heart that is not sound. A heart that is corrupt. So then, the real question is, if the dimension of Ihsan is to have our hearts be safe when we meet Allah, what is the ultimate tool to cleaning it? Dhikr. It's a tool called dhikr. What is dhikr? Is dhikr... Give me an example of dhikr. Subhanallah, that's a form of dhikr. Anyone else? Alhamdulillah, yeah. Salaam ala Rasul Salaam ala Quran Salaam ala Rasul Anything else to be dhikr? Allah. Allah. There you go. Say Allah, Allah. Anything else? Listening to a culture or a lesson. Knowledge and ilm. Come on. What is dhikr? In other words, what are we learning here? Dhikr is anything that reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Technical definition, though, the technical definition is utterances with a present heart. You see the difference? Because you can say SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, and in fact, you can even recite Quran. And it still won't be the good. It'll be Quran, Quran, it'll be Tasbih, it'll be great things, really. But it won't be the good until there's a dimension of religious experience, there's connection. This is why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He says in the Quran, that prayer protects us in the salat to tinha ani. You know the verse. Ani fashay ibn Kadi wal dhami. That prayer wards us from, protects us from fashay ibn Kadi wal dhami. Many, all forms of immorality that we're not supposed to engage in. Can you, can you just be honest? Just be honest, okay? Praying five times a day, does that alone protect you from immorality? Why is Allah saying it? He's saying, Inna salat, inna, hadatni. This is when you see inna in the Quran, this is toki. Inna, verily, 100% prayer will protect you from these things. What kind of prayer? Exactly. What kind of prayer are we talking about? We're talking about a prayer with khushua. What is khushua? Prayer with a connected heart to Allah. See what I'm talking about? Now, Dhikr in general was incredibly emphasized by the Prophet. The Prophet Muhammad he said that the one who does not make Dhikr is equivalent to a fish out of water. Fish out of water. And there's so many other analogies. 
that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave about the practice of dhikr. What would we say dhikr? Doing utterances with a present heart that remind us of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In addition to that, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us something so phenomenal. This is why Ihsan, the actual phrase the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives is about religious experience. Because to, to worship Allah is if you see Him, come on. Like, do we have to, just let's use our brain, common sense, what does that mean? To be in the presence of Allah, that when you make dua, you feel dua. When you pray, you feel prayer, right? That's what it means to worship Allah. And that is where taqwa comes from. We say mindfulness, okay, how can, I mean, subhanAllah, you have this beautiful story that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi narrates about someone who's about to commit zina. About to commit zina. And yet, Right before the act of zina, he doesn't do it. Because the person that he was going to do it with said, Ittaqillah, have taqwa, have taqwa. What caused him to say, yeah, yeah, you're right? Did he go through like some mental, like, hmm? She said, have taqwa. Should be mindful. What is taqwa? <laughs> Did he go through this, like, I mean, he's, he's about to do the act, right? Ittaqillah immediately stops. What was it? it? Something happened inside his heart that protected him, that gave him a presence, that, that gave him a hayat, a form of shame. Hayat is also a, an act of the heart. It's not an act of the body. This is one of the greatest misconceptions of Islam. Hayat is manifests in the body, but it is truly an act of the heart. There are people that dress, you know, guys who can dress with hayat and have no hayat. This is why subhanAllah in Syrian culture, right? We use the word, we use the word not usually to denote clothing. When someone acts in a way that violates like etiquette and hurts someone, we say, This guy is like, he's no hayat, he's no, he's no shame, he's no modesty. Right? SubhanAllah, the Prophet sent me says about his heart. He said, verily the heart rusts, rusts. And what cleans that, what polishes the heart? What does he say? The kuva. The kuva. Now, the reason why we talk about this is because, I mean, this may sound controversial to some of you, but it's not controversial. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I truly believe one of the greatest crises that we have in our community in North America is that we undermine the role of religious experience. And so, and then now we like sit back and like, oh my goodness, Muslims, are, they love yoga. It's like, okay, what's, what's your problem? <laughs> they love yoga, but they're not in the message. It's like, can you give them an experience like they get a yoga? If you can't, that's your problem. Don't blame that on them. People want to feel connection. This is why, no matter, I mean, look at our culture, Tala. When I grew up, not too long ago, the new atheist movement was at its peak. At its peak. My professor, tenured professor, it was so at its peak that they were brazen enough to just simply, like, literally, he could just say, yeah, Islam is nonsense. He could just say, like, you religious people are nonsense. He could say that, nothing would happen because it was so powerful. What happened 10 years to, to 15 years ago? Not even, not even a decade, right? New age spirituality, astrology. Uh, people want to meditate. Meditation is the biggest, meditation is a multi-million dollar industry. Self-help is still a billion dollar industry. Why? Because it's part of our filter. Allah designed us this way. He designed us to need connection with God. You can try to fill it in other ways. It won't, it won't, it won't be as powerful because the system of Islam is that that connection is also connected to Iman, which is connected to Islam. That's what we have to offer. Some people may have profound religious experience. Right? You can't say that it's not real. They tell you it's real. But what we have to say is that maybe real, but is it connected to the truth? And here's what truth is from the prison of Islam. 
that holistic model. I say all this to say, how can we undermine religious experience when I truly believe, this is why I've been doing this my whole life, right? People who have connected, people who have experienced the love of the Prophet and said, not talked about it, not heard it in conference, no experienced it. Well, Allah, it is impossible for them to leave Islam. It's impossible. Stay. People who had, and again, we said in the beginning, we don't base our belief system on experience, but we sustain our faith through experience. Did you hear what I said? We don't substantiate Islam's truth through experience. Because everyone can say, I had an experience with Jesus, or I saw the Prophet on Sunday. Anyone can say that. But we sustain it through that connection in the heart. That is how growth happens and it allows us to maintain commitment to the fiqh. A lot of the people, they find fiqh hard. They find the rules of Islam hard because they haven't truly connected to the lawgiver himself, Allah. If you haven't cultivated love for Allah, it's going to be harder to worship. The Prophet tells us, this heart of yours that is so central to sustaining your faith, Dhikr is the way that you keep it polished to sustain your faith. Now, to conclude, oh, I have one more thing to address with you before we do our Dhikr plus Inshallah. Because don't worry, I'm watching the clock. And I like to, I, I like to do it. One of the greatest misconceptions ever in the last God knows how many decades, especially in America, is people who say it is forbidden for us to come together like this and do dhikr together. We're not allowed to have this experience together. What's the dhikr? Very weak. Which is why the majority of scholars never say this. And yet, you go to maybe the average mosque in America, and if you sit in a circle and you just start saying, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, people are like, What the heck are you doing? This is bid'ah, haram, shit, leave the masjid. Okay, happy. Bid'ah according to whom? Okay. Bid'ah according to whom? We have to talk about this because a lot of the people, when I first started doing this in my masjid years ago, the way I started off by saying, Look, this may feel weird to a lot of you. No problem. There's nothing wrong with that. But this feels weird to me isn't how we determine whether something is right or wrong. <laughs> because a lot of people say religion is weird to me. Is that an argument for the truthfulness or the falsehood of religion? Say yes or no. Religion is weird. These religious people are weird. Is that an argument against religion? Okay, have you actually first let's understand why do you think it's weird? What's caused you to feel it's weird? <laughs> Feeling something is weird or I'm not used to this is not how we determine truth in Islam. And if we actually look at the Sunnah of the Prophet, you will find that this was not only permissible, it was recommended. And it was this act that has preserved Islam in the hearts for centuries in every Muslim land throughout our history. I promise you, there's not a Muslim land in history that doesn't have what we call a culture of group dignity. It doesn't exist. You go to Egypt, I challenge you, you will be, it'll be impossible for you to not encounter majalis and dignity everywhere. You go to Cape Town, ask a Cape Townian Muslim, Cape Town, the Islamic Cape Town is over 300 years old. They all will tell you, even those who don't even want to do it, they will tell you Islam in Cape Town was preserved through group dignity because it kept the hearts alive that made faith penetrate, that made it penetrate the mind, it made it penetrate in the heart. The Prophet saw something, I'm give you two hadiths, just so you know. And then we'll maybe experience this together. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, one time he told his companions, he said, when you encounter the gardens of paradise, graze therein. Meaning, enjoy them. 
Sit back, relax, chill, relax, enjoy them, enjoy the gardens. They're in a desert. What gardens are we talking about? <laughs> Companions are, you know, they're intelligent people. So he said to the Prophet, you know, what, what are these gardens, Ya Rasulullah? What did the Prophet say? Authentic hadith. He said, the gatherings of the king. In another hadith, and this is the last hadith I'll mention, it's one of my favorite hadith ever. And there's a million more like it. A million more evidences like it. I can give you evidences from history. I can give you evidences from hadith. I can give you from evidences from, from Quran, which we just heard. A million evidences. This hadith, though, is particularly amazing because it highlights that the dhikr culture and the practice of group dhikr is a healing practice, even for those who think it's weird. Can you imagine there's a hadith about someone who thinks it's maybe weird and doesn't even come for that reason? They still get healed by it. Do you know what this hadith is? The Prophet said that foretells us of a conversation between the angels and God. I'm going to do this very quickly. The angels tell Allah, Allah, there's all these people that have gathered just like yourselves only to remember you, to do the key, together. It's a hadith, Qudsi, Sahih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, they only gathered for this reason. The angels say, only for this reason. Allah asks them, what are they asking? The angels say, oh Allah, they seek refuge in, from you, in, in you, from hellfire. And Allah says, what would happen to their hearts if they actually saw hellfire? Meaning, wow, they have this fear of hell and they haven't even seen it and they have this wara. Are they asking for anything else? Oh Allah, they're asking for paradise. Allah says, if only they saw paradise. Long story short, as my father likes to say, the Prophet Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, because they're asking for forgiveness and they're asking for these things, he says, go down, right, and deliver the message that they're all forgiven. They're all forgiven and they're granted whatever they're asking. So then, this is my favorite part of the hadith. All right, humor me. I love this part of the hadith. The angels go back to Allah. And they say, Allah, we have a problem. What's going on? They say, Allah, there's someone there that didn't really come for this. He, he had a business like, uh, you know, uh, relationship with someone there. He, you, know, you know, sometimes you walk into the mansion and like, there's a lot, like right now, someone come into prayer, but then I'm talking, and it's like this awkward moment. It's like, I didn't come for a speech. Fine, I'll sit down. You know what I mean? I guess what happened. Uh, he comes in, oh, oh, okay, they're all making victim. I guess I'll have to sit down now and just wait. So that's what happened. He walks in, he just sits, he kind of waits. The angel said, he didn't come in for this reason. What do we do with him? He says, Allah says, and he gets the same. He is forgiven and granted all that he seeks. Because, humul qawm. La These are the people, the cream of the crop. No one in their presence will leave wanting or distressed. That even the power of group thinking is that even those who don't engage but simply listen, it has a magic that transforms their heart and brings upon them the pleasure of Allah. May Allah make us people of dhikr and allow us to come together for dhikr. For the Prophet said, any gathering that human beings have that is void of dhikr will be seen as a regret on the Day of Judgment. May Allah protect us from regrets. We'll break from the